Hi, John. Do you want to try your uh, microphone? Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you just fine. Uh, your camera's not coming on quite yet. Okay, I've been having problems signing on here. Uh, how do I get the camera on here? I apologize. It's something I are you on your is it an iPhone or something? It's an iPad. iPad. Um, I personally have not joined a meeting with the iPad. If there's anybody, um, as far as our uh, commissioners, if you have any advice, would be greatly appreciated. How about that? Uh, let's give it a moment. Keep talking. Okay. There you go. Right. There. Okay. You, you got it. I guess the Thank one that you. says push video button is the one they use. <laughs> okay. Michael, do you want to uh, try your microphone? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And there Perfect. you are. Wonderful. Bill, this is Carla. I just want to let you know you have a quorum, and also Jordana is not going to be joining us this evening. So you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Sounds great. Thank you for that update. And yeah, let's get it rolling. Hold on, please. I want to make sure I have the full agenda up in front of me. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody to the meeting of the Measure O committee. Uh, let's start with a roll call of all the committee members could uh, introduce yourselves. That'd be great. You know, I'll go ahead and do it for you. Um, Member Hickman. Here. I'm sorry, Chair Hickman. Vice Chair Franchi. Uh, present. Member Cuevas. Marco. Right here, here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Member Carrillo. Here. Member Mather. 
Here. Member Tubb? Here. Everyone is here except for Jordana, who is not going to be here this evening. Great, thank you very much. And Madam Clerk, are there any public communications today? No. Okay, well, so to the agenda then, uh, item number one is the Brown Act training. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, are you gonna lead us in that? Or what's the procedure? Here? I am not, so, uh, um, one of our city attorneys, Megan Lorenzen, is going to lead us in that, and she just messaged me on the the password for the event. She said is not working for her. Um, should we just Tracy Carla? Should we just have her log in regularly, and then you can pull her up, or how do you want to do that? Sorry about that, um, Mr. Kuhn. I was getting pulled in two different directions. Um, actually, if Meg, if you can let Meg know, um, if you just access the agenda on our website, if she clicks on that link, it'll bring her in, and then I can move her from the attendee to a panelist. Thank you so much. Well, I guess I was going to say, do you think she's ready to join soon or do you want to go on number two and then come back to number one? So she's doing the first two items. Okay. Um, I think it would be beneficial to do those before some of the other ones. But if we want, maybe if we did item six, the financial update, um, where it's a very brief financial update this time, and then maybe that would give her enough time to get in and get situated. Sounds great to me. Meg, you are a panelist. You can oh. go ahead and unmute yourself. There we go. She, she, she beat us to it. Just want to go back to the original plan then. Can yeah. I hear you okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Let me get my video up and running. I'm so sorry about this. No problem. Take your time. We're all good. Thank you. Hello, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Megan Lorenzen, and I am an Assistant City Attorney here with the City. Um, I haven't met any of you before, so just a quick introduction. I um, have been with the City for a little over a year, and I work very closely with the Finance and Parks and Recreation Departments, as well as a number of other specialized areas. So I have been asked um, to present to you tonight on the uh, meeting protocols and uh, the Brown Act. Next slide. So the Measure O Committee has a series of protocols or rules of order that they have to comply with. Next slide. At the first meeting, the committee adopted the City Council protocols. These protocols include the Rosenberg's rules of order that establish standard procedures for local governing bodies. Next slide. The committee adopted the council protocols to ensure consistency and transparency across the board. This ensures that the member that a member of the public doesn't get confused by separate sets of rules for every council board commission and committee. Next slide. Uh, later this evening, the committee will be electing a chair and vice chair who will be responsible for conducting the meetings. However, there is always the circumstance when both members are absent or late to the meeting. And in that case, the committee se selects a chair pro tem was the power of the chair until either the chair or vice chair arrive to the meeting. Next slide. 
Rules of order are the rules a council commission board or committee adopts to govern the procedures of a meeting. Here, the Rosenberg rules of order have been adopted, and these are simple, straightforward rules that establish the role of the chair, the discussion process on agenda items, and as well as the motion and voting process. In addition, the chair has his or her own rules of order to ensure the meeting is conducted smoothly. Next slide. Under the chair's rule, the chair's rules of order, the chair rules on all issues of order and procedures. This ruling is subject to appeal by the committee, and the committee can also waive or modify any rule by a majority vote. Next slide. So for all voting, the Rosenberg rules of order state that if you're present at a meeting, you should vote for or against an item, and that you should only abstain from that item if there's a conflict of interest. In addition, once a vote has been taken, you cannot change your vote. Next slide. Uh, the Rosenberg Rules of Order also provides some general guidelines for public speakers. For non-agenda items, public speakers are limited to 30 minutes total with a maximum of three minutes per speaker. The city also uses speaker cards that a member of, a public, of the public can fill out in order to provide public comment. However, during the times of COVID and things being online, public speakers do have the option to indicate in the chat function that they would like to um, speak or they can email the uh, clerk's office. For agenda items, public speakers are limited to three minutes per speaker. Uh, the speaker is allowed to cede time to another speaker. However, they both must be present at the time the speaker is talking. Next slide. Under the Rosenberg Rules of Order, there are three basic types of motions. There is one that moves an item forward. In that case, it would be, I move that the committee recommends X. Another type of motion is one that amends the motion. And the last is one that substitutes the motion. Next slide. An amendment to a motion is a change, changing the basic motion. So if the committee was to move forward with one, or motion to move forward with one of staff's recommendations and another committee member wanted to add a simple nuance to the motion, they would move to amend the motion by adding that nuance. Next slide. To substitute a motion, it means that it would throw out the main motion and propose something else. So if a committee member wants to move forward with staff's recommendation, but another committee member wants to propose something else, they would simply state, instead of doing staff's recommendation, I propose the committee do Y, and that would substitute the motion. When there are two or more motions, oh, sorry, next slide. When there are two or more motions on the floor, the last one made is voted on first, and then next, the main motion is voted on. Next slide. In addition, committee members have the ability to divide the question. So if the motion is, is to do multiple things, this allows committee members to move to split the question and vote on elements individually. Next slide. For example, there might be a motion to appoint Smith and Jones to a subcommittee. And while you might support Jones, you don't support Smith. And so it leaves the question of whether or not you leave, you vote yes or no on a motion. However, by dividing the question, you allow individual and separate votes on Smith and then another vote on Jones so that committee members are able to adequately show their support for one and opposition for another. Next slide. And these rules are designed for efficiency. It's intended that you're able to conduct the meeting smoothly without spending too much time on each specific rule. So if you have any questions about a rule or how to make a motion, you should definitely ask before voting and we can provide as much clarity as you would like. Next slide. At this time, I can take any questions you might have on the specific um, rules of order or um, protocols. I think it's pretty clear. Thank you very much. 
Okay, great. Well, then I will go ahead and move on to the next portion. Next slide. So I've also been asked to cover the Brown Act or open meeting laws. Now, it's my understanding that a couple of the committee members may be new to the committee, so this might be your first exposure to the Brown Act. But I hope this presentation is informative and please feel free to ask any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. And for those committee members who are familiar with the Brown Act, this should provide a good refresher as well as highlight some changes to the social media laws that have come up in the past few months. So the Brown Act generally requires that meetings of local agencies be open to the public and properly noticed. Next slide. As a lawyer, I try to figure out what the legislature was trying to accomplish in enacting its laws. In the Brown Act, the purpose was written directly into the act. It was designed to ensure that the deliberations as well as the actions of a local public agency are performed at meetings open to the public and free from any veil of secrecy. Next slide. Now the Brown Act applies to legislative bodies, which must conduct their meeting their business only at public meetings where they can consider only items of business listed on their agendas. It requires that all meetings are open and public and that all persons are allowed to attend. Next slide. The Brown Act applies to any legislative body, and this includes the governing body of the local agency, which in our case is the city council, as well as commissions, committees, and boards. However, the Brown Act does not apply to meetings that involve them less than a quorum of the legislative body. Next slide. A meeting is defined as any congregation of a majority to hear, discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item within subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body. Where we have to be extremely cautious is when the committee uses a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item of business that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body, as this is often where a violation occurs. Next slide. Now, a meeting is defined as any congregation. Oh, sorry about that. However, a meeting does not occur if a majority of members play an independent role and partake in independent actions to take an ultimate action. For example, in the case of Go Lightly, a delegation by a county board of supervisors to various staff members to review and approve social services contracts for areas of expertise did not constitute a meeting. This is because each position, the county council, the auditor, and the clerk of the board took independent actions to review and approve the contracts, and there was no actual deliberation on the contract. Next slide. Now, one potential Brown Act violation to be aware of is a serial meeting. Serial meetings are a chain of communications, each of which involves less than a quorum of a legislative body, but which together involve a majority of the body's members. It is also a concerted plan to engage in collective deliberation on public business through a series of letters or telephone calls passing from one member of the governing body to the next and excluding the public. Next slide. Under the old law, a series of communications could occur through telephone. However, as technology has developed, email, instant messaging, texting, blogging, and posting on social media all constitute communications. So please be hyper aware of these communications as they easily can create a virtual serial meeting. It can be as small as circulating a letter for signature. In common cause, a letter was circulated that needed to be signed by a majority of the body. And simply by signing off on the letter, the court found they improperly engaged in a serial meeting. Next slide. So as city attorneys, we hate email. So this means commissioners need to be extra cautious with email. It never goes away and can easily create a virtual serial meeting. Even if the emails were later disclosed to the public, it still deprives the right of the public to participate. And there are three problem buttons in email that I want to highlight. Next slide. The first is the send button. Simply by sending an email, you lose control over your communication. 
It can be forwarded to anyone. Anyone could eventually see it, including a majority of the other committee members. Next slide. Next is the reply all function. If the email chain contains a majority of the committee members, simply replying to all is a serial meeting and a Brown Act violation. Next slide. And lastly is the forward button. This can create a string of communications that together include the majority of commissioners, even if they are not all included on this single message. Next slide. So what starts out as legal under the Brown Act, meaning I think we should adopt staff's recommendation or I think we should recommend this project at the next meeting, becomes illegal when it's replied to by a majority or by reply all. By expressing your opinion in a reply to all email, a Brown Act violation has occurred. Next slide. Commissioners should also be extra cautious with other internet communications and social media. Even when you're blogging, posting, tweeting, liking, commenting, consider the Brown Act. Serial meeting rules that apply to traditional communications and email apply to other digital and social online conduct. Next slide. Recently, the state legislature enacted AB 992. And so this uh, new includes social media communication as communications under the Brown Act. And so this new law becomes effective January 1st of 2021. I apologize for that typo on the slide. And it states that simply posting general city information without personal opinion or comment is probably okay. But social media communications with other officials about matters related to matters under the body's jurisdiction violates the Brown Act. And so that can be as big as making a post or commenting on the post of another committee member. But it also includes those digital icons, liking, loving, laughing, etc. That constitutes a communication and can quickly become a Brown Act violation. Next slide. Now, there are a number of exceptions to the meeting definition. The first is individual contacts or conversations between a member of the legislative body and any other person. This means you can have a conversation with a member of the finance staff or a member of the public without concern. In fact, the city council appointed you to this position so that you would talk to the public about Measure O issues. So if you run into a friend at the supermarket and they ask you about updates, feel free to talk to them. Committee members can also attend public or education conference on matters of general interest without implicating the Brown Act. In addition, publicized and public meetings to discuss a topic of local community concern organized by someone other than the city does not constitute a meeting. Next slide. Committee members can attend open and notice meetings of another body of the public agency. For example, the measure O committee could attend a city council meeting without having to notice a meeting of the measure O committee. You can also attend open and noticed meeting of a standing committee within its own agency, provided that you're not a member of that standing committee. And purely social or ceremonial events are allowed as long as no discussion of business within the subject matter jurisdiction of the local agency is discussed. However, it is important to keep in mind that what starts out as legal can quickly turn illegal. For example, the committee members might attend a conference and at lunch, the, the members begin to discuss a speaker they heard that morning. The moment someone says, we, could sh we should consider this great idea the speaker mentioned, the conversation turns from legal to illegal. Next slide. For regular meetings, there are uh, certain notice requirements. This means that the agenda must be prepared and posted at least 72 hours before the meeting and be made available to the public. In the agenda, there, it must contain a brief general description of all of the items to be discussed or acted upon. Now for special meetings, the notice and call must state all business to be transacted or discussed, but it doesn't need to be posted until at least 70 or 24 hours prior to the meeting. Next slide. 
Now it is highly unlikely that the committee will ever need to hold an emergency meeting, but if it does, it must provide one hour notice to the media unless there's a dire emergency or no access to telephones. Next slide. At meetings, non-agenda items are allowed in a number of circumstances. Non-agenda items often come up during public comment. The legislative body member or staff person may briefly respond to questions or comments by the public. For example, if someone is asking about the status of a project, you can provide an estimated completion date if you know it. Or if the speaker is talking about uh, one specific line item in the Measure L fund, you may direct them to a finance staff member who can answer their question. Next slide. There are some statutory exceptions to the notice requirements. A subsequent need item requires immediate action, which came to the attention of the agency after the agenda was posted. For example, the committee posted its agenda on Monday for today's meeting. And this morning, the finance director became aware of an urgent issue related to Measure O that needs immediate action by the committee. Now this item could be added to the agenda if the committee finds by a two thirds vote that the item arose after the agenda was posted and closes before the next meeting. Once it's added to the agenda, a simple majority is required to take action on it. A holdover item is an item continued from the prior meeting. And this is allowed as long as the item posted for the prior meeting was posted not more than five calendar days prior to the date the action is taken. Next slide. Now in the agenda, there should be a brief statement of date, time, and place of the meeting, as well as a brief general description of the nature of each item. It should include the notation that staff reports and other documentations on file with the city, and that questions may be directed to the city manager, city clerk, or another city. Next slide. Now the public has the right to address the legislative body. At regular meetings, the public can address the legislative body concerning items of interest to the public within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. And this public comment period happens before action on the item is taken. For special meetings, the public has the right only to address items that are listed in the agenda. Next slide. Members of the public are allowed to attend and speak. We may request that a person, person wishing to speak identify themselves. However, we cannot require it. Good practice allows for a speaker to remain anonymous if they desire. Next slide. In addition, the public has the right to record, photograph, or broadcast the meeting. However, we do not have to provide them with power to do so or allow bright lights to film. In addition, we can impose a reasonable speaker time limit and courts have found that three to five minutes is a reasonable time. However, we must provide at least twice the allotted time if a person is a English speaker who utilizes a translator. Next slide. In the case of disorderly conduct, the committee may clear the room and continue the meeting on agenda items if the meeting is willfully interrupted by a group so that the orderly conduct of the meeting cannot be restored by the removal of the disruptive individuals. This is a very high standard and should be used only in extreme circumstances. We recommend calling two to three short breaks before clearing the room. The committee has also set rules of decorum. Disruptive behavior such as yelling, clapping, or demonstrations may be prohibited. Next slide. Now these next couple of slides on closed sessions are likely inapplicable to the Measure O Committee. So I, go, I will go through them fairly quickly. Um, and the primary reason for closed se sessions is to protect private, confidential, and privileged information. So these just uh, provide the specific purposes for closed session. Next slide. And again, these are additional reasons to hold a closed session. Next slide. And this just discusses the closed session agenda requirements. Next slide. 
Uh, after closed session, we must report on uh, real estate negotiations after the agreement's final, and we must report approval to seek or refrain from seeking appellate review or decision to join a litigation as amicus curiae. Next slide. Again, this is just going over some reporting requirements for closed session items. Next slide. In addition, the Brown Act uh, mandates that there are no secret ballots. Votes of all members present must be recorded. Next slide. In addition, documents at the meeting are public. The documents distributed more than 72 hours before the meeting must be posted on the website and a reasonable number of copies must be provided at the meeting. Next slide. If there ever is an inadvertent error, it can be cured or fixed. A cure is not admissible as evidence in a civil or criminal action, but the city can critical deadline. The cure possibly could render the action void to try errors as much as possible. Next slide. But for ongoing or future violations, the city does not have to be given an opportunity to cure this violation before being sued. Next slide. A member of the legislative body who attends a meeting in violation They would be guilty of a misdemeanor if they both, next slide, they satisfy two requirements. Uh, the first requirement is that action is taken by the legislative body. Decision is taken. And it also requires that the member intends to deprive the public of information to which the member knows or has reason to know the public is entitled. Now this second requirement is a low burden. And simply by attending this session and listening to this presentation, you have a reason to know the public is entitled to public information. The Ventura County DA's office was one of the first in the state to prosecute for a Brown Act violation and has been a leader in this area since. So violators do face an actual risk of criminal prosecution. Next slide. Now, a civil Enforcement action is possibly a more serious remedy than criminal prosecution. Now, one violation of most committee members and becoming committee members is desire to affect change in his or her community. In a civil action, the action taken by the committee can be undone. Now, this goes against the primary reason to become a committee member in the first place. And it, in addition, you run the risk of losing the confidence of the public. Next slide. The, uh, the uh, court can also seek a court order or the public can also seek a court order requiring the legislative body to tape record its closed section sessions, which may be subsequently reviewed and released by court in a future enforcement proceeding. Um, and the court can also seek an order of what Voiding certain actions taken in violation of Brown Act. Next slide. And I am happy to take any questions that you may have about the Brown Act at this time. All right. Well, great. Looks like Thank we're you all so much. For yeah, it was really informative. Thank so you, Mr. Brandon. Thank you. Have a good evening. You as well. All right, great. Uh, looks like the next item on the agenda is the selection of chair and vice chair. Uh, walk us through that a little bit. Yes. Next slide, please. All right. And so I just I just created a brief table just for reference um, for the committee members. Obviously, we all know Mr. Hickman is the current chair. Uh, John Frenchy is the vice chair. And then current committee member, 
Jordana um, also has served as past chair. Um, so just want to provide that uh, reference information to all of you before you begin your deliberation on selecting the chair and vice chair for next year. And are there any um, guidelines or rules uh, on limitations of how many times you could serve as chair or vice chair, anything along those lines? There are not. Okay, great. Well, I would like to open it up to the rest of the committee members, see if anybody is interested in either of those roles or has any uh, comments or questions. Yeah, this is Danny Carrillo. Uh, I thought we selected you and, and John at the end of the last meeting that we had in person. No, John and I came on at the beginning of this year. I think this may be the second or third meeting that we've been in this role. It actually was a little bit delayed from last year, a meeting or two behind. Um, I'd be willing to, you know, continue in my role, uh, depending on the schedule of the meetings and such, but, uh, we are a little bit behind, but, um, I think we're just trying to get back on track right now. If I'm correct, Mr. Kuhn. Yeah, that is correct. You know, and I had, I had the same thoughts, like, there's no way we're already going to be you know, talking about chair and vice chair again. We just did this. Um, but you know, that's, you know, we, we, the vote was delayed until January. Like I said, so there really has only been, um, I think, three meetings since since last appointment, but it is um, protocol to do uh, to reappoint the chair of vice chair uh, on a yearly basis. So are we going to take each uh, office separately or can we do both at the same time? Oh, hi, it's Barb Mather here. I just have a question on are there any specific criteria that you're looking for in either the the chair or the the vice chair office so just a willing member of the committee right <laughs> and then obviously the uh the committee as a whole will need to take action and vote um and then to answer uh your question member carrillo um you you could either you could do it either way you could do it as one motion or you could do it as two separate motions thank you what are the responsibilities So, uh, basically, going back a little bit to the um, you know presentation that uh, Ms. Lorenzen gave. Uh, so, basically, the the chair is going to chair the committee, lead the committee. Um, all the, also, the chair is um, obviously the one for the committee that uh, works with staff to set the agenda, um, and kind of the chair works to coordinate with all the all the members and any items um, that may, may need um, be requested to be added to the agenda. And then the vice chair just serves um, serves as the chair in the chair's absence. And just to build on that a little bit, it's a relatively light lift uh, overall. You know, I definitely have worked with Mr. Kuhn and others a little bit behind the scenes just to prepare for the meetings and such. Um, but it hasn't been anything that has been a huge time commitment or anything like that. So. That's why I'm willing to continue on, or I'm happy to uh, step aside if anybody else is interested in taking the chair role. So I'd like to make a motion that we continue with Bill Hickman as the chair and John Frankie as the vice chair. I'll second the motion. Is there any other discussion before we uh, vote on that? Um, hearing none, Madam Clerk, would it be appropriate for you to do a vote roll at this point? We may have lost the clerk. Maybe she didn't hear me there. Mr. Kuhn, would you like yeah, let to me, call uh, for a vote here, or what's the uh, procedure in this uh, situation? Of course, let me, um, I'm messaging them right now, let me check, and then if okay. we don't have anything back okay. from them. I'm back. 
There they are. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're moving to continue with Chair Hickman and Vice Chair Franchi. Is that correct? That's the motion on the floor. Yes, correct. Okay. We'll move forward with the vote. We'll start with Chair Hickman. Yes. Vice Chair Franchi. Yes. Member Cuevas. Yes. Member Carrillo. Yes. Member Mather. Yes. Member Tubb. Yes. And Jordana is absent. The motion carries. Great. Thank you very much. And Mr. Kuhn, do we want to go on number four or number five since we're, you know, kind of on the topic of meetings? Um, we, we can go with, uh, we can go with, uh, number five, if you'd like, and, or, you know, kind of stay on the same topic real quick. Yeah, I think that'd be fine. And okay. I think that the meeting schedule that's proposed in the agenda looks fine for me. Um, you know, personally, the, the Monday or Tuesdays are best. So that Tuesday schedule similar to this year looks good. Uh, do any committee members have any comments or any conflict on those dates? And, and real quick, uh, Mr. Chair. So the, the, on November, it was listed as, uh, the either or because that is election day. Now it will be an off year for, for elections. You know, there won't be any, um, city elections going on, but there will, um, if, if meetings re do resume in person, um, that would be the, our typical meeting room would be an election location. Um, so that is just why, you know, so like that, you know, typically it would be the Tuesday, but on that instance, just like we are meeting tonight, um, it may be good to meet on that Thursday. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments or concerns with those dates? It's member Carrillo. I think it works for me also. Great. Uh, does anyone have a motion to approve those dates? I'll make a motion nope. to approve. Second. So, point of clarification: If we could get you to uh, just make the, including the motion the the date you'd prefer for that last one, just because it does um, say the or, and um, I think for the official regular schedule um, <clears throat> that we that we have to have just one. Well, I prefer that Tuesday personally, but if there is a big conflict, I'm willing to move to. I don't know, it's a little wash I don't know if that's good enough for a motion, but that's my uh, two cents. And we, we probably could find another room, right? I mean, if 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 it's just the room situation, I mean, we've kind of you know hopscotched on rooms before, so I don't think that's a big issue personally. We we like I said if if. I said, hopefully we're meeting in person again by then. <laughs> I mean, if we are, we, we, we could work on finding another location. You know, we just have, would have to notice it, but we could definitely work on that knowing um, well in advance. I, I guess I would actually no, right? So, so if, if we are um, actually, yes, if we're meeting in person, um, yeah, we'll be, Car Carla will be there to staff the meeting. Um, and you know, typically the, the city clerk's office doesn't get involved on that end when we're meeting in person. Super. So I'd prefer to stick with the all Tuesdays if possible on my end. I'm good with Tuesdays as well. I agree. Same here. Great. So is that uh, initial motion stand or do we need a, a second motion now? So. It sounded an awful lot like um, that, that uh, you know, Mr. French and Mr. Creo, uh, you know, both uh, agreed with the amendment to the motion. It wasn't quite worded that way. Um, but if you just, I guess, for, like I said, if you, technically, if you want to ask them to amend the motion and then if we can get them to agree to the technical amendment, would be good sure. to take the vote. That's fine. I'm all about procedures. So that's totally fine. Uh, could you please amend the motion to reflect all Tuesdays? Okay, I, I amend the motion um, to reflect that we do our meetings on Tuesdays. 
And I continue to second that. Thank you. I'll move forward with the vote. We're moving to have the schedule for 2021. Their meetings will be on Tuesday, February 2nd, Tuesday, May 4th, Tuesday, August 3rd, and Tuesday, September 2nd. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, we'll go I ahead. Thought it, I thought it was November 2nd. Yeah, Tuesday, or November you, 2nd. Oh, maybe I heard September, sorry. <laughs> you may say that do you, right want me to, do you want me to go through them again? Yeah, please, just for clarity. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Tuesday, February 2nd. Tuesday, May 4th. Tuesday, August 3rd. And Tuesday, November 2nd. Correct. Okay, we'll move forward with the vote. Chair Hickman. Yes. Chair Hickman. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Chair Franchi. Vice Chair Frenchy, I'm sorry. Yes. Member Cuevas? Yes. Member Carrillo? Yes. Member Mather? Yes. Member Tubb? Yes. And Jordana is absent. And the motion also carries. Just, oh, sorry, Carla, cut in too soon. Also, just so the committee members are aware, um, typically sometime late May, early June, we do typically have a, a special meeting. Um, with regards to the budget, like I said, it, um, and but so when it gets closer, um, we'll, we'll discuss that meeting um, if needed and get it scheduled. There's like like was um, mentioned earlier. There's always the ability to add those special meetings to a later date. Thank you. All right, super. Uh, well, let's move back to item number four then. Mr. Coon, you want to help guide us through that one? Yes. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so here we're just going to be going over, uh, like I said, the a review of the ordinance ballot language. Like I said, um, you know, a lot of the uh, members on this committee have been with us uh, for quite a while. Um, we do have kind of three new members, and you know, it's just um, one of these things that we um, that we that's good to review. So the the responsible. So there's base three basic responsibilities uh, that the committee has uh, as outlined in the ordinance. The first responsibility would be to participate in the budget process um, by reviewing staff's proposals and making recommendations on those proposals to city council. Um, next click please. And the second one is to review the independent audit uh, for measure O and present those findings to city council. And so that will at your meeting. Um, in January, we will, we will have. Um, It, I actually need to double check, but either the meeting in January, or the one after that, um, your your first or second meeting next year, um, we will we will be presenting the measure of audit. I know that the overall audit will be complete um, in early January. Um, I just don't have confirmation on uh, the um, the smaller measure of audit. Oftentimes, they won't um, officially kick that off until after the main one's complete. Uh, next, uh, click please. And then to meet quarterly or as often as necessary to accomplish these objectives. And as you've just done, you've, you've adopted a calendar to meet quarterly. Um, and then, you know, typically it has been that, you know, there's been one special meeting added um, each year during the budget process. Um, so those are the, the three main roles as outlined uh, by, the, by the ordinance that created the uh, measure O. Uh, next click, please. All right, and so now just going to go over the ordinance and there, there's nine different items in the ordinance that are, that are, um, that are specifically referenced for potential funding. Now, while measure, measure O is a general purpose tax, so while legally um, it could be used for any purposes of the general fund, um, during the uh, election process and through the ordinance, uh, the, the, um, the city council has made the commitment to focus on these nine areas. Um, and that is something that, like I said, you know, city council has, has, has discussed on several occasions, the committee has discussed on several occasions, and is both the, uh, ha has been to this point both the belief of city council and the committee um, that, that we should stick to these areas um, as presented in the ordinance and the ballot language to stay true to the information that was given to the voters. And so next click, please. 
And so this one is protecting the local water supplies and establishing water conservation programs. And while now, um, while these items are eligible, that, that may not mean that we need to do each one of these items. Like I said, there are with drinking water in particular, um, obviously that is still a very high priority for the community, um, but there, there are also other funding mechanisms through the through our enterprise or our wastewater uh, and water funds that provide funding there. Um, but this could also be used to support additional needs in those areas as well. Uh, next click, please. All right, and the second priority is maintaining and improving fire and police and paramedic response times. Uh, next click. And this next one is keeping all, all the fire stations open. Um, as, as I'm sure the, the current committees have, uh, have heard multiple times, and, and actually I believe Chief Indaya uh, presented in his update last time, that at one point, uh, Fire Station 4 had been closed down um, and it was there was some grant funding extended, um, but we're in jeopardy of uh, closing the fire station again, uh, which was one of the um, one of the things that was um, behind the push to uh, get measure implemented is to keep that fire station open, which it is uh, still open to this day and funded. Uh, next click, please. And then protecting local beaches, rivers, coasts, coast waters from pollution. Um, and so this is done typically through stormwater projects. There's been several stormwater projects. There's a there's actually um, this year being funded a uh, uh, stormwater master plan, I guess you can call it. And basically, it's kind of just an overall study of the system, looking looking at what improvements need to be made uh, to improve stormwater quality. Uh, like I said, and protect our uh, beaches, rivers, and the coast. And then next click, please. And then keeping neighborhoods safe from gangs and drugs from gangs and drugs. Um, this, like I said, th <laughs> this is um, like I said, one of the things um, that obviously there's there's um, the extra task force forces that have been added um, in the police department through Measure Up. Um, and and like I said some of the task forces have their have their purpose of helping in this area, especially the uh, enhanced patrol. Uh, next click, please. And effectively address the homeless issue. Um, as we all know, uh, homelessness is, um, you know, is is an you know, opportunity or kind of a challenge the city's working with. Um, and Mesros played a key part in funding the opening of the um, year-round homeless shelter, um, and obviously paying for the ongoing operations. That's that those are costs that we that we split with the county. Um, next click, please. And then protecting and seism seismically repairing bridges. Um, I, I, you know, this is something that we we have done some some studies to date. Um, repairing bridges is um, expensive, um, and so this is something that, I, like I said, Public Works is is, is always working on, um, especially as different bridges. And like I said, they, they've done some design work for Mesuro, um and plan to try to get as much grant opportunity as possible, um, and then you know use Mesuro funds as matching to make those go as much as uh, as far as possible. Like I said, because you know, for example, there's um, one bridge in the city that needs replaced, um, and just to replace that one alone would be fifty million dollars. Um, so, so, <laughs> so yes, bridges are very expensive, um, but like I said, it is a key priority for our um, obviously the city, the public works department, and I know they're constantly working with the state on trying to get every grant opportunity they can uh, to to leverage and maximize the measure of funds for that purpose. Um, next click, please. And then we have maintaining local streets, roads, essential city services. Um, like I said, you know, so so every year, um, you know, Measure O contributes money to uh, to to slurry streets, to sill streets, to improve them. There's also money that goes to to the sidewalks um, to to help in various different areas of the city as well. Um, and then the next click, please. And then here we have improving services for seniors, disabled, veterans. Um, and uh, um, last year, uh, last fiscal year, uh, Measure O funded the uh, the senior senior citizen master plan. Trying to make sure I was getting the wording right. Uh, that master plan was just uh, just recently presented to City Council within the last month. Um, was approved by City Council um, and, and and is moving forward and um, is eligible for for additional funding as Measure O if needed and one um, funding is available. I mean, I, I do want to um, 
Um, and then obviously one thing when it goes to kind of maintaining um, our local streets and roads, I do want to point out, you know, we do have the uh, our um, our parks and recreation department that takes care of all the city trees. Um, there are longer streets than our roads, and that is also um, a big part of, like I said, you know, keeping those those trees well maintained and looking nice, but also providing a safe environment, um, making sure the tr trees are well trimmed so that we don't have uh, too many branches falling. Um, like I said, so that is just a, you know a key piece there as well. Like I said, so that's a high level overview. Um, obviously, these main points uh, for uh, funding are approved funding for for Measure Up. Um, next slide, please. And then here's the ballot language. And, and then as you look at the, I'm not going to go through the ballot language in detail, but kind of the point here is, you know, that basically the ballot language um, and, and those, the ordinance, they, they match very closely. There's some small differences, you know, for one, you know, just to point out one, if you look at the very bottom, it says services for seniors, veterans, and youth. While youth isn't mentioned um, in the, the ordinance, um, like I said, once again, you know, it is, um, even though it's not mentioned specifically in the ordinance, it is still a qualifying. Uh, you know, qualifying pur purpose, you know, those um, after school programs and um, youth safety and whatnot. Like said, and so, and so that's like I said, just the high level overview of kind of the ordinance, the ballot language, measure O. Um, and so, if you have any questions at this point about um, any of that, uh, I am more than willing to, to take them and um, help out as much as I can. Great, I think that was a nice overview. Do any uh, committee members have any uh, questions or comments? I have a comment. Uh, Michael, I just want to tell you, I've been driving around the city. The streets are looking fantastic. The sidewalks, uh, I noticed in Midtown, there's a whole bunch of sidewalks uh, being fixed to help the handicap go down a lot easier on the corners. <clears throat> neighborhoods at a time. And the parks look terrific, uh, several of the parks Everything's trimmed. I think they're doing a great job. Yeah, yeah, our, definitely. Our, our, you know, our, our um, outfacing departments are definitely they're they're working really hard to you know to make good use of the measure of funds and to um, you know beautify the city and take care of our infrastructure and make the city safe. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, as you uh, will know, I've been a proponent of getting more uh, money weighted in that first item that you mentioned, the protecting the local drinking water supplies and water conservation programs. Uh, you touched on that briefly saying, you know, there's, you know, I guess money in the general budget for that. Um, could you maybe expand on that a little bit more and um, uh, explain why that hasn't been more of a priority in Measure L? Yeah, and so and so there's kind of there's two different things. There's there's kind of the the water supply issues that kind of are kind of internal water um, <clears throat> base, and so there that you know so, so obviously um, I think we all probably have heard about the Ventura Water Pure Project, um, which is one one thing that's currently ongoing to work on addressing water supply issues. Um, but obviously, water supply goes a lot beyond that. I think there's a you know a lot about protecting our water sources, protecting the groundwater. Um, you know, protecting the beaches, and that go, does go in more into stormwater. Um, and they said stormwater typically is funded out of the general fund, and there, there's not a lot of funding for it. Um, so, like I said, there have been some stormwater projects um, presented to us, uh, Mesro that have been work, um, worked on their design. Um, there's been some lift stations um, and whatnot, but really, um, like I said, this year there is. Um, there's, there's a study going on and, and the intent um, from staff is to bring forward some of these stormwater projects that will obviously help keep uh, ground, um, that will help keep the groundwater runoff as clean as possible when it's entering um, our streams, rivers, um, estuaries and, and all those other sources of water. And like I said, those are, those are things that we, we will be coming up. And, and I know in particular, um, I think last budget cycle, uh, Chair Hickman, you'd mentioned uh, the possibility of rain barrels, right? Kind of supporting, um, you know, a rain barrel program or something like that. Um, you know, and, and that is, you know, that, that is something you know that I, I haven't forgotten about. You know, as we go through the um, budget process, is something we can um, talk about looking looking at as well. But like I said, there are, there are stormwater, uh, large stormwater projects on the horizon, um, and oftentimes it's just a matter of trying to get the dollars to match. Um, with one one best to fit the projects in, 
Um, but like well, I said, there's still more questions to be art and price. Finish up. So I'm sorry. Nope. Oh no, I, I was just, just saying that. Up, so you're good. <laughs> All right, my apologies. Well, I would just argue that storm water is different than clean water and drinking water. You know, those uh, water conservation programs and things like that, those are totally separate from storm water. That's before we actually, you know, deal with the water that's running off. You know, we're talking about drinking water supplies, water conservation programs. I mean, I know there's already a storm, I mean, excuse me, a water barrel program out there. Um, so this isn't necessarily protecting the beaches from stormwater. This is actually drinking water and freshwater supplies from the way I understand the measure. Yeah, like I said, and then and you're right. You know, and like I said, when it comes to the freshwater part, you know, that that's not something that has been prioritized in Measure O um, right now. Like I said, you know, when we get to the the providing water supply, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and, and you know, and really, you know, we would we would spend all of the Measure O money. On that one priority, um, if, if we're to go down that route, and, and there, there is other funding available, um, obviously, if needed, Measure O is always there. Um, but it's kind of you know the priorities to this point have you know with Measure O have been okay. You know, if we if we use it all on water, it's going to get eaten up way too quick to, to help with the other items. And so it's more the the funding opportunities are being pursued outside of Measure O, but still the the clean water is a very high priority. Great. That's good to hear. I know early on I accepted the fact that, um, you know, some of the conversations were that, okay, well, you know, this is a multi-year measure of ballot um, initiative, you know, things are going to get, you know, kind of different priorities, different years. And I accepted that, but it still hasn't been any sort of change. And obviously the Ventura Water Pure Project, the Pure Water Project is huge. I mean, that's that's beyond the measure O, um, you know, financial capabilities, but uh, is there some public awareness? Is there, you know, some outreach efforts that could help make that, um, you know, more acceptable to the public or, you know, other things that can be done? It just seems like we're just kind of passing the buck when it comes to that very first item that was on the, um, you know, description of Measure O. So, you know, I hate to belabor the point, but, you know, it just seems like we're kicking the can down the road rather than fully addressing it. Yeah, so you know, as staff, we can definitely uh, definitely review um, different potential programs as we come up. But you know, I know also just another example. You talked about kind of communications efforts. We do actually receive some some grant funding for those efforts, and some there are some unique funding sources within uh, once again water and wastewater for those efforts. Um, but like I said it's definitely a conversation we can have to see if there's you know see if there's anything um, that would be worth enhancing with metro dollars. Great, thank you. And if there is um, some sort of, you know, official list that could be procured at some point saying, hey, you know, we don't need to address this in Measure O because we got grant money or mm -hmm. other money, I think that would be, you know, a lot more uh, visible and, you know, easier to digest. So, you know, okay. I'd appreciate that if that's possible, yeah. So, and what, what staff will commit to then um, is, like I said, as we come back with the budget process, we will either have some recommended water projects or a list of, hey, look, here's some projects we're going to do, but here's the other funding sources we're using. Great, thank you. Okay. For the master stormwater plan, when is that supposed to be completed? I am not quite sure on that, but I know that Phil Nelson is on the line tonight, our public works director, and he may be able to provide a little bit more insight on the, on the timeline there. Went ahead and brought you over as a panelist. Yes, thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Hickman, members of the committee. My name is Phil Nelson. I'm your public works director. I can answer a couple of those questions. Um, one is with regard to water, um, as Mr. Kuhn mentioned, it's an enterprise funded um, portion of the budget. And so through fees, we've been executing projects. We've actually done probably about 16 million this year. We'll do 20 million a year for the foreseeable future, the next five years or so. And so there is money available uh, working on both clean water and wastewater. Uh, that's why we really haven't used the measure rows. We haven't needed it as much. And as Mr. Kuhn indicated, other items like stormwater have no other funding source. So if it's not general fund or measure all, we won't do any stormwater projects. So that's where we've really been focusing the measure all money. With regard to the, the master plan, we're working on that. Probably will be wrapped up 
making either the end of this fiscal year. And my hesitation with that is we're waiting for the regional um, new MS4 permit to be issued from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. It's probably going to happen sometime in the spring, and that will largely drive what we have in our master plan. So we're kind of waiting on getting that before we can finish it up. But I, I'm thinking maybe sometime around summer, we should have a, a, at least a pretty good idea of what's going to be in that plan. But in the meantime, we have another number of projects uh, that we are seeking measure O funding for, uh, for the stormwater system. And at a future meeting, I'll be coming back to you to talk about those and and um, hopefully get some of those funded. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Any other comments or questions? Uh, hearing none, let's move on to the next agenda item, unless uh, there's anything else on this one, Mr. Kane. No, that is all I have on this one. So next slide, please. All right, next slide again. There we go. Okay. And so we just wanted to present you a brief uh, financial update. At the, at the last meeting, um, we presented kind of a more quarterly update with some projections. We haven't done any new projections since then, but obviously we do have an update on what we what we've received in revenues and spending, and so we wanted to give that to you tonight. Um, so obviously the, the biggest revenue source in the um, measure O is, is the measure O tax, the, the sales and use tax. Um, we have just over $12 million budgeted for this year. We've received about $2.3 million of that so far. Um, and you know, so far we could we were about 33% through the fiscal year. Um, and while the 19% might look low, uh, don't get too worried, it's actually pretty good for this time of year because the sales tax payments we always get um, at least three months after uh, the month that it's, that it's assigned to. For example, uh, let's see, August. So last week, we just barely got the payment from the state for the month of August. Um, so we, we've only received two payments so far this fiscal year. Um, and like I said, for those two payments, 19%, we're, 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 tracking, um, we're tracking well. So, and then use of money and property, that is um, our investment revenues. Um, like I said, so and those, those are... Um, so those, those are tracking a little low, um, you know, and, you know, a little a little lower than we anticipated to this point, um, and that's we will continue to monitor those um, as we move throughout the year and as the interest rates continue to to change. Um, and then the other miscellaneous revenue, um, this is the county's reimbursement to us for the operating agreement with the uh, with the homeless shelter. So we pay the, for the full amount up front, and then they reimburse us 50%. And so this revenue is that reimbursement. And so as you can see, you know, so far year to date, we've gotten just about two and a half million dollars. Um, and while that doesn't sound like a lot, you know, really sales tax is the primary driver and we are doing well so far um, in that uh, um, sales and use tax. So that's, uh, that's the quick highlight of the revenue so far. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, and then here we have the expenditures. Um, so there's seven, seven various departments on here, um, non-departmental, you'll see at the very bottom, it's kind of just used to track um, you know, reserves. Um, other than that, there's kind of six, six departments. Uh, city manager's office, that is where we house most of the homeless and safe and clean initiatives. Um, you know, they're, they're you know, fairly close to being on track uh, for their spending for the current fiscal year. Um, community development um, is, is a new new department to the Metro Fund this year, um, and this is the uh, the annual support costs for uh, the low income housing uh, program that we and that the housing authority helps us manage and, and report back on. Um, and we just haven't received a bill yet from the from the housing authority, um, but you know the, that one hundred twenty thousand dollars will be will be spent uh, during the current fiscal year. Um, obviously, parks and recreation, you know, the big thing here um, is the beautification, tree maintenance. Um, there, there's some safe and clean. Uh, there's uh, the downtown ambassadors. Um, also, a portion of, of, um, of that effort comes uh, comes out of the park and recreation's the budget here. Um, like I said, they're, um, they're, they are a little um, 
under for the year. Um, but like I said, but they, you know, they, their their spending is a little bit more seasonal, um, um, and you know they typically get a good job uh, getting things done. And the police department is is looking to be right right on track uh, with their with their spending so far for the fiscal year. Um, then we have the fire department. Like I said, once again, looking to be fairly on track. Looking like there there may be a little bit of savings there um, so far. Um, and then once again, public works is is very cyclical. Um, you know, there there there's kind of ebbs and flow with with the designs and with the uh, ideal construction seasons. Um, but once again, you know, they they are um, like has been mentioned. You know, they're they're out there. They're they're doing streets. They're they're doing sidewalks, and um, they're working hard to uh, make sure that. Uh, the funds are used wisely, wisely on the beautification and safety efforts for the city. Like I said, and so so far, year to date, we've spent just about 3.5, uh, 3.6 million dollars uh, in Metro. Uh, like I said, you know, tracking very normal compared to prior years. Um, you know, no no large concerns um, in the expense category yet, and we'll be monitoring those. Um, and that's really kind of the what we have right now for the financial update. Um, and 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 then at our next meeting, we will have a more um, comprehensive financial update. That that will include um, projections for, for the remainder of the fiscal year as well. And then um, I am they said that's the end of my report on this item, and I'm available for any questions. Well, Michael, it's Barb Maser here. I have a question on what the fiscal year is. I, I thought it was the calendar year, but it appears to be different. Oh, yep, no worries. So our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. Ah, great. Thank you. Yep, no worries. Great, thank you for that update. Just a uh, kind of a question for clarification on my end. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it seems like some uh, shopping has shifted to online, whether it be Amazon or other places. I know they do a better job of tracking sales tax for those. Does it go down to the level of Measure O or could you maybe touch upon that a little bit? Yes, definitely. Like I said, you know, I, I don't have a specific amount of Measure O money we're getting off the, off offhand from sales and use tax. I mean, I mean, from from Internet sales, um, but very good point. You know, Internet sales um, and the and, you know recent ruling about two years old now from the sp Supreme Court um, in their uh, Wayfair decision um, that they made it so we could collect sales tax online from from most sources has really saved us during the pandemic. You know, it, 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 without the Internet sales, we'd be seeing a much larger hit. Um, to our revenue collections um, than we currently are. And so like I said, we, I mean, the the revenue collections from, from internet sales continue to skyrocket and they really are kind of um, helping to uh, dampen the impact of the COVID related uh, recession and downturn. And so uh, I guess more specifically, I mean, I don't really pay that close attention to it personally, but so the sales tax rate would include the measure O um, increase and essentially that slice of the pie would still be coming to the city um, theoretically, that, right? That is correct. Yep, that slice of the pie is still coming to the city. Like I said, so kind of, you know, the state kind of collects it all and it, uh, all the businesses remit their taxes to the state. Um, and then based on our tax rates, uh, the state will divvy it out. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Mr. Kuhn, is there you have this broken out as to which of the nine uh, categories these fall into? So city manager department tackles three categories. These are the categories. Here's the percentage and here's the amount. Uh, yes, it can be done. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, you actually, quick question. Uh, would you like to see that? Uh, when would you like to see that? Well, would the next presentation be fine or would you like it before then? Um, I'd like to be able to review it before the next presentation. So if it could be included agenda, that would be great. Okay. Yes, that's perfect. Excellent. I just, I just wondering, like, you know, should we, should we get to work on it now or can we just update the processes, but we can do that for the, um, in the next packet agenda, uh, you will see it. Um, um, like I said, if, if not, it may be a separate, uh, attachment. Um, we'll, we'll see kind of how we work it out, but we'll make sure it's included. Great. Yeah. I just want to see it before I'm sitting here reading it on a little screen. <laughs> yep. Great point, thank you. Any other questions or comments on the financial update? Well, hearing none, let's roll into agenda item number seven then. 
All right, and just for your information, once again, our Public Works Director, Phil Nelson, will be presenting on this item. Good evening again, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, next slide, please. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about a proposal for a program for repairing sidewalks. Uh, it's a policy proposal that was initiated by City Council, and we're desiring to have it funded through Measure O, which brings me here tonight to present it to you and uh, hopefully seek your approval. What you're looking at is a map that we maintain in our uh, GIS database. It's available on the city public website. And it shows all of the sidewalk disruptions throughout the city. A disruption is any point where uh, you have two different sidewalk panels and one is higher than the other, or it's misaligned, so it could create a potential trip hazard or, or some other problem. And all of those dots indicate a different disruption either one that we've identified through inspection or one that's come to us through a, a citizen notification. The reds indicate all of those disruptions have been reported for which we've not uh, done anything yet on them. The yellow indicates disruptions where we've gone in and done a temporary fix, which generally uh, usually involves putting uh, asphalt down to ramp between the uh, disruptions. So at least you have uh, kind of a smooth path. It might have a bump in it but it doesn't have a tripping hazard. And then the green are where we've gone in and actually replaced panels and done a permanent fix. So we use this information you know, to put together how we put together our repair programs. I'd like to note that the city has over 420 miles of sidewalks. It's about 2 million square feet of sidewalk. And you can see from the disruptions, and given the age of our city, not surprising, we've got quite a few repairs that need to be made. Historically, over the years, prior to Measure O, we received about $47,000 a year to repair sidewalks. And when you consider that a repair generally is three to $5,000 each, $47,000 doesn't go very far. Thankfully, to Measure O, since its passage in 2016, we've spent about $2.5 million repairing sidewalks. And that's the green that you see uh, we have a couple of projects going on, as someone noted earlier in Midtown, and one on the east side right now that's wrapping up. Those fixes are not reflected in this map, but we'll see more, more green dots that appear. But even at that rate, we've only done, since 2016, about 40,000 square feet. So when you compare that to 2 million square feet of sidewalk, it will take quite a while, even at our current spending rate, uh, to address all of the all of the problems which I think brought uh, the council to uh, to uh, to put together or propose another program uh, to help expedite that for those residents that would like to help participate in paying for the repair of the sidewalk. Next slide, please. These are just some pictures uh, that show some of the before and afters, typical disruptions that we see. You can see how badly that panel looks. Uh, the blue areas, it's maybe hard to tell in the picture, but it's elevated, creates tripping hazards, obviously not good for our residents, also creates a liability for the city. We do have a duty to take care of sidewalks, make them safe to travel on, uh, and we do get lawsuits each year from people who have tripped on sidewalks and, and feel that the city is responsible for that. So we definitely want to cure those, and you can see on the right the type of repair we're doing. Next slide. Here again is some other indications. Most of these disruptions we're talking about are caused by tree roots that you can see on the left. Uh, the trees are great. We all love them, the way they shade the streets and the properties. Uh, but it's particularly in older neighborhoods where the trees have become very mature. The roots have also come under the sidewalks. And I think we've all seen where they're getting lifted and creating the problems. So we really want to go in and not only repair the sidewalk, but address the root issue. And you can see the pictures there where we've done that. Next, please. So this is the program which we're proposing. Uh, and what I'm seeking tonight is uh, uh, your approval, your recommendation that I can go back to council to be able to say that the Measure O Committee supports this uh, and answer any questions uh, that you may have, of course. But the way the policy would work is it would be a 50-50 cost share. So a resident who has a qualifying sidewalk and by qualifying, it would be a sidewalk disruption 
where the sidewalk no longer meets the ADA requirements for safe travel. It could be the separation in panels, like I mentioned. It could be the panel is so uh, badly sloped in one direction that it's just really difficult for thinking of our, our citizens that are more challenged in moving, uh, that it'd be difficult for them to, to go across. We also want to take into account that not everybody could afford a 50-50 share. So those who qualify uh, low income, and we would use the same criteria that Ventura Water uses for determining low income with regards to relief on some of the water bills. Uh, in that case, it would be a 75-25, the city picking up 75, the uh, resident picking up 25%. The program would be funded with $350,000 from Measure O. Uh, that would be divided to $50,000 for each district. So really trying to equitably spread that out. A citizen would submit an application for the repair they would like to make, uh, provide us with pictures. We would go out and inspect the sidewalk, make sure it is a qualifying one. If tree work, roots are involved, then we would get the city arborist involved to make sure that when we re, re, uh, repair those panels, or replace them, that the roots also get, get addressed, so that we don't have the same problem again in five years. The um, the resident would hire a qualified contractor. Uh, we would not qualify them. What we'd be looking for is a contractor that holds the appropriate licenses, is registered with the Department of Industrial Relations, and then meets all of the city um, design standards with regards to sidewalks and route management. They wouldn't need to get a permit. The application and approval would serve as the permit itself. And then once the work is done, it would be inspected by a city inspector. And then the resident would submit an application for the reimbursement, which again, as I mentioned, would be uh, the 50-50 up to a total of uh, maximum of $2,500 on the city side, or it's the 75-25, it'd be a maximum of $3,750 from the city. Uh, and the, the remainder remainder being paid out of Measure O. If in the course of the fiscal year, and, and because these would need to be, uh, all the bills would need to be paid within the uh, program fiscal year, we would be looking for the work to be completed by March, April timeframe. So it could be inspected, submitted, and then the, um, uh, the reimbursements paid before the end of June. If by chance uh, a certain district does not use up the full 50,000, uh, after April 1st, we would be able to use that money in another district on a qualifying repair, or public works could use that money for a sidewalk repair somewhere else in the city, or it could be returned to Metro, any of those uh, above. Um, we would provide quarter a quarterly reporting, of course, as to uh, how the program is progressing, the applications, the projects that have been done, how much has been paid out, and really hope that this will uh, provide an opportunity for residents who want to expedite the process of repairing sidewalks in front of their homes to be able to do that uh, by participating in the cost. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, would ask for uh, your uh, support and a recommendation as we go to council later this month with this program. This is member Carrillo. Um, what are the parameters and what are the low income limits? You know, I, I apologize. I don't have the exact details. I know they're, they, that they have certain criteria in terms of uh, different programs that you qualify for with the state uh, and some other means. I don't know, Mr. Kuhn, if you're uh, uh, more familiar with what is needed to qualify for low income. I like I said I am I am not like I said typically you know when you're talking CDBG you know it's going to be uh, you know 75 80 percent of uh, uh, the median um, household income. So I I can uh, uh, I can certainly give more details on that uh, and provide that to you. I, I apologize. I just don't have that tonight. I also have a follow-up question, if I may. Um, did you happen to take a survey of the residents, or how did you come to this program? Uh, this was actually proposed by Council Members Friedman and Nazarenko. 
So uh, they have promoted it. There are actually a number of cities that do this. Pasadena is one that we've looked at theirs and modeled ours largely on theirs. And there have been some others, but it, it was uh, generated from those two council members. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Nelson, Barb Mason here. Quick question. How do you see a need to prioritize the 50,000 for each district? And how would you set those priorities within a district? Currently, it, we would do that on a first come, first serve, and they first need to meet the eligibility requirements, which, is a, as I mentioned before, are any of those items that uh, would make the sidewalk not compliant with the America with Disabilities Act. So if somebody came forward and said, you know, I've just got some really bad cracking or it's discolored, I want to replace it, we would say, uh, no, that doesn't qualify. Uh, the disruption, the, the uh, change in uh, elevation between the panels, I believe, needs to be greater than a quarter of an inch. So, again, anything that would be, you know, very minor, we would say, no, that doesn't qualify. And talking with other cities, or at least from what we've gathered by looking on the, their websites, it seems to vary whether they uh, get a lot of response or not. Uh, we're not we're, we're not sure what kind of a response we get, and if it is overwhelming or we get more than we anticipate, then we would look to probably uh, prioritize more towards those disruptions where uh, they generate the most trip falls and would seem to be generate the most injuries. And that's generally around between one inch and two inches of disruption are the ones that we really target when we spend city money to fix those. But for now, it'd be first come, first serve. Uh, Phil, uh, John Franchi here. I had, I had a question on the tree roots. Um, when you when they, they clean them out on those big trees and we replace the sidewalks, how long does it take for those roots to come back? Is it something we're going to be doing every five years? Or should we take the tree out and plant a new one and so we don't have to worry about it for 20 years? Just mm -hmm. curious. No, that's, that's a great question. We've talked quite a bit about that. So, we would trim the roots, obviously, and then there are root barrier systems that can be installed. They have varying degrees of effectiveness, and it really depends on the species of tree and if how the roots grow. But we be, we would be looking to do more than just trim the roots. We would want to put in uh, some type of system that would either prevent or greatly retard uh, the roots' ability to get back underneath the pavement. In some cases, we may need to remove the tree. We really want to do that as a last resort because in most cases, these are, are healthy, mature trees and obviously will very much change the appearance of the street and the property value. Uh, but in those cases, if we had to, and it would be mostly probably from the health of the tree. If the tree was just not healthy and we would let the arborist make that determination, then it would re be replaced with a tree according to our city tree master plan that we feel is appropriate for that type of setting and, and which would mean has a root system that we wouldn't expect it to damage the sidewalk in the future. But that would be a last resort. We really don't want to remove trees if we don't have to. Do you anticipate then if you were to do the, the, the thing with the roots where they don't grow? looking at maybe 10 years before we have that issue again? or in, in many cases, when we've been able to put those in, we do get greater than five years. Uh, without a root barrier, we're, we usually have a similar problem within about five years. We don't want to spend money on a repair. We just have to go back to in five years. Uh, we're, we're completely in agreement with you on that. So um, we do find the root barriers are, are pretty effective with most species. They are difficult or can be difficult to put in depending on the geometry and how much room you have to work in, uh, but they are, they can be pretty effective. Well, thank you. Like I said earlier, everything is looking really good. I can see a big difference in the city. So thank you for all your work. Well, thank you. We're, we're pleased and proud to do that. And thanks to Measure O, that really has made a huge difference. And if I can chime in as well, just want to touch back on one of the questions asked previously. Um, I, um, you know, I was sent, sent by another staff member listening in. Um, information on the uh, low, low, what the low income standards would be. It would vary depending on uh, the size of the household. Uh, but you know, an average household of, with four people, um, the limit would be $65,500. Thank you for that. You're welcome.
Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Nelson. I, I you know, especially love the cost sharing uh, options here when they come up. That's really great. And I think, Mr. Kuhn, this may be a question more for you. Um, it sounds like this will be coming out of the budget for this fiscal year. Will this, um, uh, you know, kind of elbow something out of the budget or how does it affect things that are already allocated for? Yes. So the proposal would be to, that we, we would start um, providing funding during next fiscal year. Like I said, you know, it'll, it'll take a little bit while to get the program up and running. In the spring, the Public Works Department would start accepting applications, but wouldn't actually start um, paying for anything until next fiscal year. So we'd program that into next fiscal year's budget. Um, and with anything with Measure O, you know, um, they're, they're limited funds, so it'll just be a matter of kind of reprioritizing and putting a little bit more money towards uh, sidewalks and other areas. It, it, Chair Hickman, if I may add, I, I neglected to mention, and I, I just want to have full disclosure, uh, obviously, there's staff time involved in doing this and managing the program, the applications, the inspections. Um, most of the people who would be doing that type of work are, uh, are are funded through the projects they support. So we would be looking to use a portion of that money to pay for the staff time. Uh, but keeping it very small, we don't anticipate this being a heavy lift, uh, but we will have to cover it in some uh, using the measure of money. I just wanted to make sure that was everyone was aware of that. Gotcha. Thank you. So would you anticipate a fairly seamless like approval process once they get submitted and be a fairly quick turnaround? That would be our goal. Um, our challenge is, you know, we're, we're not getting any additional staff to do this. So we're still trying to figure out what that flow looks like and who's going to be doing it and what other work they're not going to do because they'll be doing this. And, and it'll depend on the applications as well. You know, if we get you know, one or two every couple of weeks, this will be fine. If we get 10 a week, then we're going to be really challenged. So it'll depend. But our goal is to turn them around real quick and spend as little time as we need to on them. Great. Uh, and then I also have a, another question uh, following up on the equitable uh, distribution. Just in general, uh, is city uh, keeping track of the allocating like roughly the same amount uh, of resources, projects they work on in the various districts, or do you have uh, that metrics, or maybe you can create that sort of like representation that I can see what percentage is going within each district? We do track uh, all the CIP in which district it is, uh, but I'll be honest, we uh, the district is not a criteria for project selection. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting information to have after, but we really are a requirements driven. So we look at where the need is the most, uh, in some sections of town, like a number of years ago, we spent a, a very heavy investment um, on the west side. We have more money going into the east side right now. Um, where we spend money on streets is really based on street condition, not location, street condition and volume. So it's it's a requirements driven prioritization, but we do keep track by district and we can provide that information. Okay, great. I was just wondering, since the since the program itself is being done by districts, if the city was following the same suit. Thank you. When will the rest of uh, fiscal year 2021 and to 2022 be available for review? Are you referring to the financials or to which part? Yeah, to the financials for it. I guess in general, it might be a question for Mr. Kuhn. Yeah. yeah, so we'll start looking at those at your second meeting um, for next calendar, your second meeting for next calendar year. As My biggest con <laughs> oh, thank you. My biggest concern here is it kind of appropriating funds ahead of seeing the rest of the budget. I understand that there is a timeline of how you'd like to city staff and get communication out to residents, but we don't know what the rest of the budget's going to look like. Yeah, like I said, and so we can we can definitely take that. Um, like I said, I, I, it'd be interesting to hear the the rest of the committee's uh, thoughts on that. But obviously, um, you know what we do um, do. You know, typically we, we try to provide kind of feedback like that um, in, in the staff report to city council um, as well when um, when committees are making recommendations. 
We will be transmitting our capital improvement or proposed capital improvement plan to council in January and certainly can make that available to you. So I guess the, the question for measure O then is whether this falls under measure O funding, correct? Uh, this particular program? Yeah, like that's why it's being presented to us yeah. is to say it, whether or it, not it's under or could qualify um, for it. Sidewalks traditionally have, as I mentioned, we spent two and a half million. Um, so I, th I think that whether sidewalks do or don't, that question's probably been answered. Uh, so the real question is, is this uh, a good way that you think that measure O money should be spent uh, on sidewalks or something else? Or uh, is this something you would support doing? using measure of money. I think building on Ms. Tubbs uh, comments, it, it seems to in some regards be the cart before the horse. I mean, I can agree in theory on this, but without seeing the whole budget, it's tough to really weigh everything. I don't know if there's a commitment to do less with the public works aspect of measure O for the next fiscal year. Um, uh, but it, it seems a, a little bit odd just to be, you know, kind of sig signaling this out in advance of the budget for next year. Um, you know, I'd love to support it, but I just want to hear some more of the reasoning uh, behind that. If I understand your, your comment, it's because you don't know what it's competing against. Or by saying yes to this, what might you be saying no to later? Correct. Understood. Hey, Bill, <clears throat> I just want to make a comment that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have funded a lot of other things this year that were for the police department and stuff that were one time funding issues because I remember asking that specific question. So I'm, I'm thinking that down the road, I agree with you. We want to know what we have. We're going to lose a lot of those one time expenses. And I think this 350,000 probably won't be much of, of anything. When we lose some of those things we funded for the police and other things, there's a lot bigger amounts of money. So I think we can probably find a spot for it, but it really would be nice to know um, what it looks like uh, before we make a final decision. And member French, I just provide a little bit of color there. So, so the, the one time funding uh, in, included in this year's budget is predominantly being paid for out of fund balance, not, not the operational revenues coming in every year. Thank you. Would it be fair to suggest um, that the committee would support the program in theory, uh, but with the understanding that uh, I can't approve it for a budget until you see all of the other requirements or all the other budget considerations? Yeah, as, as a, a committee member, I'd, I mean, I support it in principle, but I think the the reference to seeing what, what else is needed and what other funding will be um, in other places that would certainly help. But in principle, I certainly support it. Yes, Mr. Nelson, yeah, I agree. And I think the way that you phrased it, it makes it a lot more digestible for sure. So, so this is Member Carrillo. I, I tend to disagree with what's being said. I mean, to some extent, uh, I think this is a great program. We're only making an advisory to the council decision here. Um, you know, 350,000 is not a lot of money compared to what's in the balance right now. You know, we've been hearing comments about all the good work that's happening in the streets, the sidewalks, et cetera. Uh, I tend to, to move forward with it, but I don't think I have the support, but uh, I just like to make my comments known. Uh, Danny, I, I agree with you as well. I mean, I, I, I'm gonna, if it comes up, I'm gonna support it, but, um, I think it's a good thing that the, the more we take care of these sidewalks, the better the property values are for everybody in the community as well. So I think it's a big win for everybody. Just my, just my opinion. And to have shared costs, that's great. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm all about the shared costs and I'm all about the idea of the program. I just wanna know what else it's competing against before I recommend it for approval. I, yeah. I think, as, as I mentioned, I'll be going to council at the end of the month um, to be able to report something like the Measure O Committee supports the program in principle, but is unable to make a budget recommendation at this time. 
because not knowing what the other requirements are um, or something to that effect, that, that would be sufficient for me. So maybe I missed it. Mr. Kuhn, does that mean we're going to get more of a breakdown on some of the other uh, budget items or recommendations coming forward? Yeah, so, so in, the, in the typical schedule, though, so it'll still be really two meetings before we see um, the, the breakdown on the proposals for the upcoming budget. So there's still time then? Yes, that is correct. Mr. Nelson, I'm I'm good with that language. I'm not sure about the rest. Should we have a motion? It, it would be helpful to have a motion that the, that the committee voted on for me to be able to report back to council what your sentiments are with regard to the program. Okay. I'm happy to propose that motion that uh, the Majoro Committee supports us in principle, but would like to see the rest of the items falling and requesting for Measure O funding before it's recommended for approval of Measure O funds. And I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. City Clerk, do you want to help with the vote call, please? This is Carla. Um, I just want to be clear in exactly what the motion is. Um, I have the, the Measure O Committee supports in principle the uh, policy that's being set forth, but you don't want to commit any money to it yet. Is that correct? Correct. I'd like to see the campaign. I'd like to see the budget for 2021 to 2022. Okay, so it will be dependent upon the, the budget for the next fiscal year. Yes. Okay. And Mr. Nelson, does that suffice for uh, what uh, for your end? Yes, I believe it does. Thank you. Great. And Mr. Cuevas, did you have a comment or a question? Uh, yeah, I was just going to uh, say, so if we don't like approve this now, like in full and stuff, is the groundwork still going to be like trying to be late since approve it in principle for now so if the funding does come then we can just simply go into the funding process uh, that makes sense sorry if if uh, i think what i understood is if your committee decided not to either take any action or not not vote to support it this time what i would do is on the 23rd report back to city council that we came to this meeting and were unable to get your support for the reasons as I understand them, uh, but the council would still be free to act however they wanted. If they wanted to ap approve it or direct it, it be included in the budget, then that's what we would do. Okay. And and just kind of touch base on that, like, like Member Creo mentioned just a few minutes ago, so the, the Measure Committee is an advisory body, like I said, and so obviously you'll make your recommendation um, to city council, but they are not, like I said, obligated to follow that, um, and, but they would take it under consideration. Got it. Okay. And I, I would explain to them the reasons were uh, just uh, not knowing what other items it was competing against in the upcoming budget. So unable to make that uh, determination. Correct. Okay, well, we have a motion out there. City Clerk, could you please uh, read that again? The motion is that the Measure O Committee supports the policy in principle, but they're making no commitment to funding until the budget for the next fiscal year has been presented. Correct. That's the way I heard it. Hey, Bill. Yes. Uh, before we do that, are we are we able to even take a vote if we wanted to fund this? How would we do that? tonight if, if there was three of us that wanted to fund it how would that work do we have to make uh, well again i think we're an advisory committee but if you wanted to make a second motion i believe you could make a second motion and then uh as we saw in the procedures before uh i believe we'd vote on that one first and then the original motion if i'm correct right mr coon that's correct you could you could do a substitute motion um, like like was outlaid earlier or outlined earlier, um, and then you would vote on that motion first, and then you would vote on the the original motion. 
Oh, or that's not a substitute supplement. You can supplement the motion. If, if I may also comment that uh, any motion to fund, uh, and Mr. Kuhn, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't think you would be able to move to fund for next year because we're not really deliberating to do that. Um, you could probably move to fund something with this year's funds. Uh, you could also, in the original motion, support in principle and just direct staff to include it in the budgeting process for next year. I like that option as well, personally. Uh, Phil, the, the other question I had was, you mentioned that we would need some staff time to do that, and that would have to be budgeted this year. Is there a way for us to make that motion where we would allow staff to do that? Uh, you wouldn't really need to. We, we if, if council were, on the 23rd, we're going to propose that we put everything in place. And as Mr. Kuhn said, really start this program up on July 1st, start accepting applications in the spring and go through the process of reviewing them, but not really doing any work until July. If council directed us to no, we want you to start right now, we would do that um, and we would just we would figure out a way to make that happen. So you don't really need to make a motion on that. Great. Any interest in a supplemental motion or just sticking with the original motion that's on the floor? Sounds like we would stick with the original uh, motion since we're not actually voting on the actual funding. You may want to consider amending that to just recommend to staff to include it in the budget for next year. And then you'll have a chance to reconsider it again. I'll amend my motion to recommend staff to include it. And I'll second that. Great. Any other questions or comments before we vote? All right, Madam Clerk, are you ready with that amended motion? I am as ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> um, so the measure of committee. <laughs> The measure of committee supports the policy for the um, sidewalk repairs reimbursement program in principle. You're not committing any budget money to this at the present time, and you're recommending to staff to include it in the next fiscal year's budget proposal. That sounds right to me. Is that uh, the way you proposed it, uh, Ms. Tubb? It is, yes. Great. Excellent. We will move forward with the vote. Chair Hickman? Yes. Vice Chair Franchi? Yes. Member Cuevas? Yes. Member Carrillo? Yes. Member Mather? Yes. Member Tubb? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. All right, uh, that was the last item on the agenda. Mr. Kuhn, is there anything else before we wrap up? Um, no, the, the only other thing, I just had a brief, um, brief announcement from, just from staff is the new uh, Assistant Finance Director and Treasurer has started um, as of last week, Vivian Avela. Um, I mean, like I said, she is, um, she's been listening in um, this afternoon and obviously, you know, it'd be nice to introduce her in person, um, but we'll get to do that eventually. <laughs> Sounds good. Great. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate your time and uh, we will see you all next year, it sounds like. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you all. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Bill.